It's that time again. Welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical security tips along the way. I'm your all-around information security nerd and host, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting July 22nd, 2013. The first story of the week is Apple's developer website was hijacked, oh noes! Late last weekend, Apple's developer site was brought down with a message from Apple saying the site had been hacked from some unauthorized person and that some of the per personal information of some of the developers on the site may have been stolen. However, early this week, a security researcher named Ibrahim Balik claimed credit for this particular hijack or hack attempt. As it turned out, Balak was doing an unsanctioned penetration test of the developer website and he found some web application vulnerabilities, 13 some vulnerabilities according to his claims. And using those vulnerabilities, he said he was able to pull the credentials and, and other information from 73 Apple developers. Now he claims his goal was to let Apple know about these flaws. He emailed Apple about them in hopes that they would clean them up. He said he wasn't doing anything maliciously, he just hoped to find some issues that it could report to Apple. Nonetheless, the Apple took down the dev site till Thursday and the site is only now starting to come back. Apple claims they're fixing a lot of the flaws. It's unclear whether or not Apple's going to pursue any sort of legal action against this attacker. Technically, and this is something you should know if you want a penetration test, any sort of unauthorized access to certain sites without the permission of the owner in some countries could be interpreted as computer fraud and abuse. So if you're a penetration tester out there, I really don't recommend penetration testing sites that don't expect it. Anytime you pull unauthorized information from a computer, it could have legal ramifications. On the other hand, assuming Balak's motivations were pure, it's good that Apple knows about these flaws now and has had a chance to clean them up. Nonetheless, I really don't recommend you go out and penetration test other people's sites without their explicit permission. I want to quickly highlight a technical article I read talking about the rise of Tor-based botnets. Hopefully you've heard of Tor. It stands for the Onion Router, and it's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer routing service that allows you to anonymize yourself on the internet. It was kind of created for countries or nation states that have a lot of censorship to allow those users to access the internet anonymously. However, recently, starting really at the beginning of this year, security researchers have been noticing botnet authors using Tor as a command and control or CNC mechanism for their botnet. Since Tor anonymizes things, it's a great way for malware to communicate with its authors through an anonymous channel, making it hard to kind of find the actual command and control server of the particular botnet. On their blog, ESET, a security company, released details about some new Tor-based botnets. Now, I'm not going to go into a ton of technical detail, but if you are a technically minded person that is interested in botnets, I recommend you give this article a look. I'll put it in the reference section associated with this particular video, because it's interesting to see how botnets are evolving and trying to hide their control channels. Furthermore, as a quick tip, do know products like WatchGuards have application control. An application control is often used for productivity, making sure your employees are doing the things you want. For instance, you can prevent them from accessing Facebook. But it can also help for security. For instance, our application control recognizes many proxy and anonymizing networks such as Tor. So one thing you can do is use application controls logging to recognize unexpected Tor usage in your network. While some of that Tor usage might be some sort of security-minded person trying to anonymize themselves, it could also be a sign that one of your computers is infected with malware. So as a tip, I recommend you leverage application control and take a peek at what some of the applications your users are using. Let's move on to some of the bigger security stories this week. 
Next week, Black Hat and DEF CON are coming up. These are two of the biggest security conferences of the year. And before these conferences, a lot of researchers start to tease out their research. And this week, there's news of two new uh, research projects that are going to be disclosed at Black Hat that are very interesting. The first is a huge uh, SIM card uh, hijacking vulnerability that apparently affects millions and millions of phones. Without going to a ton of detail, a group of German researchers found that some phones that use some of the uh, older SIM card use a special over-the-air firmware update mechanism. Basically, carriers can send special text messages to the phones they control to update the firmware on these SIM cards. Now, these particular researchers found that if they sent a specially crafted over-the-air update message to one of these SIM cards with the wrong encryption key, they actually would get back an error message containing a digital signature. And they found out for the uh, SIM cards that use DES encryption as a opposed to say triple DES or AES, they would get back a digital signature they could use to then crack that 56-bit DES encryption key. Once they've cracked that 56-bit DES key, they can use this over-the-air update mechanism to force malicious software onto the mobile phone using that SIM card. So this is a pretty big deal. Uh, they didn't release a ton of details on exactly how this works, so I expect a lot more information next week at Black Hat. The next big story is a great demonstration of car hacking, which comes from one of my favorite uh, security researchers, Charlie Miller. I've talked about car hacking before. In fact, one of my predictions a few years ago was that we would see a lot more car hacks. Cars have these little mini computers in them called electronic control units. Uh, some of them have anywhere from 30 to 50 electronic control units in the car. And back in 2011, the University of Washington and University of California did some research research about how easy it was to hack a car. In any case, some researchers, one being Charlie Miller, a researcher well known for hacking Apple devices and then moving on to, to NFC devices as well, and someone from IOActive named Chris Velasek, released or, or pre-released a little teaser of some of their car hacking research. Essentially, they got with Forbes magazine and they showed some examples of what they could do when they took over some of the electronic control units or ECUs in a car and took over the CAN network, which is the controller area network, a network these car ECUs use to communicate. Anyways, the video I'm showing here is quite interesting. Miller and Valasek show all kinds of things they can do to uh, hack the car. They do things like uh, lock the brakes regardless of what speed you're driving, cause the steering wheel to jerk, tighten the seat belts, cause the horn to go off, and all kinds of other interesting things. So next week at Black Hat, I hope to learn a lot more about the technical details of this particular hack. So let me quickly end with some good news. Near the end of the week, the Department of Justice announced that it's prosecuting five cyber criminals in what the media is calling the biggest financial cyber uh, data breach scheme in history of all time. Essentially, they found four Russian and one Ukrainian cyber criminal that have been responsible for many of the financial banking attacks that have happened over uh, uh, the past few years. Things like the Heartland breach, the global payments breach, breaches against JCPenney. Many of these big breaches where they stole a lot of credit card information. In fact, uh, the claims are they've stolen over 160 million credit cards from different organizations and it's resulted in the loss of over $300 million. In any case, I just wanted to share the good news. It's nice to see they're actually tracking down some of these cyber criminals. As an aside, it's said that many of these data breaches were successful because of SQL injection, which is a relatively simple attack, and it's something most web developers should be able to, to fix simply by using secure coding practices. So a quick tip for web developers out there, especially if you manage e-commerce sites, go to OWASP.org, Open Web Application Security Project, because it is a site that has many different tips and techniques for making sure there's not major web application vulnerabilities in your e-commerce site. So that's it for this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And just a show note, as I mentioned, next week is Black Hat and DEF CON, which I'm, of course, attending. So hopefully the upcoming videos over the next few weeks will contain a lot of interesting research information that will be disclosed at these uh, few shows. I do expect to at least release one video next week, perhaps summarizing my activities at Black Hat. I may even go as far as to release a couple videos on each of my Black Hat attendance days, just to let you know 
know what happened each day, but it depends on how busy I am. In any case, if you want more regular security news, be sure to follow WatchGuardSecurityCenter.com or you can follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept, or follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. As always, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.